Welcome to Not Your Ordinary Parts, a podcast where we talk about hard things associated with the human experience with the goal of increasing awareness, growth, and healing. You may hear information from professionally licensed therapists, life coaches, healers, doctors, etc. This information is not medical advice or therapy and is not meant to replace actual therapy or instruction given by a doctor or personal therapist. I'm your host, Jalon Johnson. My guest today is Dr. Greer Kirschenbaum. Dr. Kirschenbaum holds a PhD, is an author, She's a neuroscientist, a doula, an infant and family sleep specialist, and a mother. For more than 15 years, she studied how genetics and experience shape the brain, the nervous system, and body to influence lifelong mental and physical health. Dr. Kirschenbaum wants families and perinatal practitioners to understand how early caregiving experience can boost mental wellness and diminish depression, anxiety, and addiction in adulthood by shaping babies' brains through simple, intuitive, enriching experiences in pregnancy, birth, and infancy. So, Dr. Kirschenbaum, thank you so much for being my guest. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me here. I'm excited to be here. I gave a brief introduction, but so that the audience can get to know you better, would you mind giving us a little bit of background about yourself, what you do, and how you yeah. got to where you are today? Absolutely. I think a huge part of the work that I'm doing now comes from my it comes from my whole life um and especially my life as a baby myself so you know there was so many stories about me and my brother as babies we were babies that cried a lot needed to be held all the time we couldn't sleep alone um we just needed a lot of input from from the adults around us and you know my parents really showed up for that um, you know, my mom was so empathetic, you know, really, really supported our emotions and our needs, however big they were. And it was unusual at the time. A lot of the people around her teased her about it. I witnessed this, you know, growing up, witnessing her being teased and and sort of, you know, she was an outsider for the way she was treating me and my brother as babies. And that really had an impact growing up. I think that was important um to really inform my interests my mom was in a lot of ways too as i grew up um i was always fascinated with what experiences make us who we are what is a memory um and how does that influence us as well and and you know these early experiences really guided me to study the brain and study how this early life experience and how emotion um, you know, emotional experiences throughout life, how they make us who we are and, and more importantly, how they shape our mental health and our physical health. Right. So, so that, you know, that, that experience of being a baby who really needed people, um, you know, led me to all of the other experiences I had, um, deeply immersed in neuroscience for, for many, many years studying, um, in lots of different labs. Thank you for that. Um, I remember when I first learned about what you do and then, um, you know, got into your book a bit, I was blown away about how impactful, like being nurtured by your parents can be and how much of an effect it can have on you later on in life. Um, and and before we get into all the meat and potatoes of what you do, I wanted to ask a few questions that may seem silly to people who already know the answers, but so that everybody can know who you are and what you do and the specifics of it. Um, Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask a few questions just to get started. And the first one is, what is a doula? Yeah, great question. I love talking about this. Um, A doula, it provides families with emotional support, physical support, and advocacy as they have a baby. So this support happens during pregnancy in many cases. A doula is there physically and emotionally supporting parents in the in the birthing room as well. And also postpartum, also as they bring their baby home and adjust to life with a new baby. And, you know, I recently did a phone session with a family who's about to welcome a baby to just sort of, you know, give them the top things that I wish for for parents to know as they birth a baby. And, you know, it really did occur to me how much a doula fills 
gaps in the birthing system for parents. You know, we really help parents feel empowered in their birth, feel like active players in their birth, um, and and really just attune and support the emotions that come around because really not many, no one else is really doing that throughout the process of pregnancy and birth. And and it's a, it's sacred, it's transformational, it's one of the you know biggest events that we experience in life is is welcoming a new baby into our family. And doulas really create space for all of that to be really taken in, in an, in an important way. And so, you know, that all sounds like, yeah, that's nice to have. Um, but what are the effects? The effects are huge too, right? We really dramatically decrease birth trauma and like emotional or, and physical, um, the outcomes for parents and babies are, are vastly improve both physically and emotionally. Um, and you know, every, every measure we can imagine, um, from birth and, and, and the postpartum experience are dramatically improved with the presence of a doula. So doulas, we wish for every family to have one. There's a lot of programs around the world, um, and throughout North America where we, you know, try to get a doula for every single family. Um, cause it is just that important. Is that something that was, um, more common back in the day? Um, because I, I think as, you know, the, the way having babies kind of progressed in our culture here, you're in the hospital and it's kind of like, just, you know, a, a, you're in and you're out and there's, there's no really sacred time that, that I would say that I see. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think what it replaces was more of a community support that that used to sort of be there more around birth. I think, you know, the history in the States and, and elsewhere as well is that birth was in the domain of midwives hmm. um, who did have a lot more reverence and ceremony surrounding this experience. Um, and so the medical system pushed midwives out. Um, and, and the community support kind of disappeared with that as well. Right. I think, I think in the past you would have aunts, grandmothers, best friends, other people, you know, familiar with birth, filling all of that, all of those needs that a doula is filling now. Um, and as well as the midwives. Yeah. For you to be that person, um, and to give families emotional stability and support around such a sacred event. How does that feel? It's just, it's so exciting and energizing. And um, I feel just so, such a trans, like so much love pouring out of me when I'm supporting families with this um, and, you know, joy for them. And yeah, it's just, I, I think that's sort of why we wish every family would have it and have that support. Um, yeah, it feels, it feels absolutely wonderful to support families that way. I can imagine. Thank you so much for sharing and for what you do. Yeah. Thank you. All right. So next question, what is a neuroscientist? Great question. <laughs> so a neuroscientist is, um, a scientist who studies the brain and the mind, um, mostly, um, you know, mostly in mostly the brain and brain anatomy. So there's so many different domains of neuroscience. Um, you can imagine all the systems we have in our body support that so are supported by our neurosystem, our nervous system. So sensory systems, emotional systems, motor systems, diseases that affect the nervous system, the brain and the nervous system. Um, there's hundreds of categories of of study for neuroscience. Um, but the, yeah, that broad definition is really a scientist engaged in studying and understanding the brain and the nervous system, and also trying to create both preventative treatments and, um, you know, treatments for specific illnesses related to the brain and nervous system. There was another um, neuroscientist who was just a bit famous who was giving you some love and support for your book recently. 
who was that and how did that feel? Yeah. So um, my, we sent our, my book to Mayim Bialik, who's uh, also a neuroscientist. And she's also really active in the parenting space as well. So that was just so fantastic. Uh, that felt so good um, to both see her holding up my book and endorsing it and also her comments that, you know, how excited she was for this message to be continuing to to spread out into the world. It was, it was so exciting. I think the only thing I was missing was for her to take it on Jeopardy with her. <laughs> yes. Yes. If it could be a question on Jeopardy, <laughs> that would be, that would be everything. <laughs> yeah. Um, it seems like there's such a broad range of what can be considered caregiving or nurturing. Um, and both can be viewed so differently by so many people and so many different things. Um, how do you personally define nurturing? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a great question. And I think it's so different in every culture. And I always try to help families tune in to, you know, what what did your parents, grandparents, great grandparents, what did they, how did they show that in your family and what were the best parts um and to try to continue and carry on those things right they're the things that make us feel seen feel good just as we are feel loved and um you know it can it can look at like so many different things right and for so many different people you know my definition is that it's really um an emotional and physical connection between a parent and a baby where us as a parent or caregiver are deeply curious as to what's going on for that baby. What is their internal world and really curious about how, how can we help that baby meet, you know, meet that baby's needs to feel seen and loved and cared for and in relationship in a, you know, sustaining relationship that just makes us both feel present and and engaged with one another. Um, Being off of the way you just define nurturing, how can the way an infant is parented be tied to their brain development and mental health? Mm -hmm. Yeah, big, big question. So I talk about a lot of the neuroscience that supports this and and we often bring it back to some major brain areas that are developing in babies you know in the in the first 3 years of life so these areas start you know in the womb and continue to grow for about the first 3 years of a person's life and these brain areas are foundational for mental health they're foundational for the stress system that we end up developing um and and are just so important for every aspect of life right i always talk about mental health physical health healthy relationships um you know success in in the goals that each individual has you know for themselves um these brain areas are are dramatically shaped in the first 3 years of life and so when we are nurturing to babies in all of the states that they're in, we are shaping the DNA of these brain structures, which shapes the proteins of these structures, which shapes how our physiology works, how our stress system works. And, um, and that is just, you know, so important for our whole life because that stress system and those mental health systems that develop from nurture and in infancy they go on to be the foundation of, of mental health as we, as we live for, for our long, long lives. I love the fact that I have you to be able to co-sign some of these questions, because as a neuroscientist, you know, if I was to go to someone and say, well, you know, if, if your mother was stressed out while she was pregnant with you, or, you know, if things were kind of chaotic, that could be encoded into your DNA. So your nervous system could be shot before you even had a chance to really know what was going on. And, you know, people say, oh, well, you know, that's just life sometimes. That's not really true. But, I mean, that's, that's not really the case. And the way you just described how the first three years and even in the womb, these things can have an effect on the baby, I think it gives it a lot of credence. 
Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. I think there's often, I talk about this in my book a little bit, um, a misunderstanding of memory. So I think when you sort of say the experiences in pregnancy or the experiences in those first few years, those have such a big impact. A lot of people will say, well, you don't remember those years. So how could that happen? Right. And it's a misunderstanding of what memory is. And it's also a misunderstanding of what shapes our well-being. They're not, it's not just autobiographical memories that we are the who, what, when, where memories, right? A memory is when an event happens that changes the circuits in our brain in a permanent way. And, you know, those circuits that we continue to use as we go forward in life, they they remain, right? So So it's true, we don't remember, most of us, some people say they do, but most of us don't remember that time, but the memories that are encoded are are very, very important. Wow. I wish I could give you a high five right now. <laughs> I love that you were able to bring that out because, um, you know, I remember seeing kids that their behavior would just be like, what, you know, what's wrong with them? And it may have been that their nervous system was in a state of fight or flight or that their brain wasn't developing properly because of their circumstances or surroundings. And to be able now to put those pieces together, like, oh, that makes so much sense. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. We always talk about, you know, every behavior has an emotion underneath and needs underneath that. And so, yes, when we see out of control behaviors, um looking for what are the feelings that person might be having that's driving that behavior and what might that person be needing um can really really shift the way that we see things and i think a lot of adults that we see nowadays whose behaviors may not be you know something that we would consider up to par it could be because they have this baby inside of them who never had their needs met or was never nurtured properly. And like you said, behind every emotion are needs too. So we may be looking at adults who are still trying to get their needs met as a child and it just never happened. Yes. I'm so happy you said that. <laughs> you know, I see it. I see it everywhere. I see it everywhere. You know, um, we are a world and that's why I'm so passionate about this, spreading this message. Our world is being run by infant brains inside adult bodies, obviously with much more complexity um, going on, but a lot of it comes down to that experience in infancy. And if we can change the experiences that babies have, we can really change our world. And I think our world needs it more than ever. Um, it's time. It's time to start making these changes. I think. <laughs> no, yeah, you're right. Major. Um, yeah. So kind of <laughs> kind of building off of that, can too much be expected of infants sometimes? And if the infants that are having so much expected of them are having these expectations from these same adults that we talked about who are, you know, walking around with undeveloped brains, how can that affect the, the children and then later on in life? Yeah. I I really do see that in so many different domains that we are asking babies to do things that their minds, their brains are not capable of doing. And it's not, it's not optimal for their brains to develop um, at all, at all. We, we really do need to shift to accepting babies as they are, loving them who they are right now, you know, not wishing that they had more control over their emotions or could do things independently or walked faster or ate better. Or, you know, we have all these lists of like things that we wish for babies. And when we, when we lead the relationship with that, um, you know, babies are not feeling our nurturing presence. They're not feeling accepted wholeheartedly. And um, and their emotions and stress aren't supported in, in a way that 
we would wish for. So, so it really, really can be an obstacle to, to growth. I think that if a baby doesn't feel nurtured or doesn't feel connected, they will then start to try and work for love and become disconnected from the feelings, but they don't want to feel those feelings because it's uncomfortable and they don't know that, you know, there's this or that happening in the background. All they know is that they're not getting what they need as a child. And I think one of the worst things that can happen for a baby is to become disconnected because if they come become disconnected at such an early age, that's just a behavior that they learn that they're going to carry out through their entire adulthood. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I, I love how Gabor Mate talks about it as um, we babies are, you know, have to often choose between authenticity and attachment. And, and exactly like you said, if they can't be authentically themselves and loved and accepted wholeheartedly for exactly who they are, then they do have to shape and change who they are and abandon their authenticity for that attachment need. It's much, much bigger. Yeah. Um, and so that's one what a lot of us of, are healing from. Yes. Yes. I was going to say one form of attachment for babies is um, connection during sleep. So I was going to ask you how important is connection during sleep for babies and mothers? Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's one of the, you know, biggest topics that, you know, I work with parents with and, and talk about a, a lot. It's, it's very important. Babies, babies needs are there day and night. It's one of the biggest places where our society needs to make a change right now. You know, we sort of tell babies at night, you know, it's, it's, we're not available. Right at night, we are expected to be alone for you know t- about twelve hours. For your naps, you're expected to be alone, and during all that time, which is a pretty significant amount of their life, at least fifty or sixty percent of their life in those first three years sleeping, they still have those needs for you know helping them with their stress, helping them co-regulate stress, some of that connection that they need. Um, and, and the need for closeness and proximity to us, their, their brains really thrive when all those things are happening. And, and it is equally true during the day and night. And that's, that is one of the biggest, biggest gaps, um, that we have right now. I see. Um, another big part of connection is breastfeeding and there seems to be a lot of spotlight unfortunately, on breastfeeding, and it's turned into something that's controversial. Um, How important is breastfeeding and what does it do for a mother and baby? Yeah, it's a great question. It, it, you know, it really, there is a lot out there about it. I think, you know, I always talk about breastfeeding and connection and or connection during feeding because, you know, we have to understand the systems that we're living in as well. Um, mothers and parents are so unsupported in um, in a lot of places, you know, um, where, who will hear this podcast. And, and I think, you know, breastfeeding is important. It was really important to me. It was something that I, um, you know, used to help my son develop in so many ways, help stress regulation, help comfort. It has so it is a source of so much nurture. Absolutely. Um, And if we're not able to do it, you know, we can still feed in a close connected way as well, bottle feeding as well, too. So, you know, I think it's really important. I think if it comes if you're if you feel supported in it, and if you feel like it's a good choice for you, lean into that because it is, it's, it's so beneficial. Um, you know, the benefits, there's thousands of benefits of breastfeeding and it is incredibly nurturing. So if you're feeling like that and you're getting advice that don't do it for, you know, more than X amount of months, or it's not nutritious after a certain amount of months, or it's harmful or 
you can put all that aside, know that it is incredibly beneficial for as long as you choose to do it. And, you know, if it isn't possible for you, also know that it's, it doesn't mean that it's all lost that, you know, that this, these nurturing experiences are beyond your reach. Um, you can absolutely still feed a baby with lots of closeness and eye contact and touch and, you know, give them that wonderful experience um, as, at the same time. I think that so much closeness and connection is established in those moments because, you know, the mother's holding her precious newborn bundle of joy and looking in their eyes. And although the baby doesn't have the words to communicate it, you know, that they're, they're feeling it and that the eye contact and so many other things, I think in those moments establish such an amazing bond. Yes. Yes. It's, it, it, it's incredible. It is incredible. And, you know, it's also, we have to remember, I talk about this a lot. We talked about this before we started recording as well, right? We're coming from, you know, we're descendants of a lot of low nurturing experiences. Some of us have a lot of trauma in our, in our family histories as well. And sometimes that can look like, you know, that kind of intimacy, breastfeeding intimacy, and, you know, all the skin to skin and things we talk about, sometimes that can be diff- really difficult. And I completely understand that um, for a lot of people, you know, a lot of people are, you know, really feeling like they can't and that um, they wanted to choose formula or choose pumping and not, and not breastfeed. Um, you know, my message is, you're, you know, you're nurturing and you're supporting yourself and your baby as best you can. And that's fantastic. Um, and we understand, right? We really understand. Mm-hmm. I feel as long, as long as you're trying your best and doing your best, I mean, you know, there, there can't be too much more expected of you. But then we also want to provide yeah. tools and resources to let you know how you can strengthen your connection and how you can nurture your baby and how you can do things that will establish emotional health and stability for your child and for their brain development. Yeah. Yeah, completely. So I think one of the biggest places parents are let down is in a lack of breastfeeding support. Mm -hmm. So a lot of moms do really do want to breastfeed. Um, And, and in that case, we really need to be able to provide that proper support. And so a lot of hospitals do have lactation consultants, But unfortunately, that support is very often not enough. And um, it's, it's, you know, if you if you really want to breastfeed, if you're if you're if that is a goal for you. And like I said, I really support that so so nurturing for for both parents for both mom and baby. um, you know, we, you do have to figure out a way to, to have more support. So to have a lactation consultant come to your home or to go to a clinic where they're offering support, it, it does take a lot of, of engaging and support to, to meet the goal, which I don't think lots of people know about. Thank you for that. Um, kind of building off of what we started to uh, discuss and what your book is about is, nurturing and doing things in a way that are healthy and supportive, but also there's the opposite of that. Um, So I wanted to ask what is low nurture and what does it mean? Yeah, thank you. So, you know, I mentioned so many times that we are really living in a low nurturing society. People feel, mothers feel that pressures from society are trying to sort of separate them from their baby, even while the baby is still in the womb, where they'll get comments like, oh, you better, you know, figure out how the baby's going to sleep on their own. You're better figure out how you're going to get time to yourself. You're going to have to figure out how to separate right away. Um, And, you know, both parents, mothers and fathers, our brains get transformed to want to be very close with a baby to not have a lot of separation with a baby and to be interacting with a baby in these really nurturing ways. And so, you know, these pressures start in the womb, in the hospital, they're there. Um, 
you know, babies put in a bassinet separate from parents and they're sort of told that's the way it should be. Um, I encourage the opposite, right? Let's hold the baby. Mom and dad can hold them skin to skin. We don't, we can put them in the bassinet, but that doesn't need to be the main place that they are. Um, Hospitals are giving formula, hospitals are giving pacifiers, right? Those can all be great choices for certain families, but it's not something that we need to give every family, right? Those also encourage separation, um, learning to swaddle right away. Um, you know, all these kinds of things start in the hospital. Um, and then when you get home, you get that pressure too, right? Don't hold your baby too much. You might have relatives or friends seeing you, you know, on a FaceTime or, you know, video chat. My clients tell me this all the time that they get that criticism. Like you're holding the baby again. What? You got to put the baby down. What are you doing? Or, you know, relatives calling constantly. Oh, you're still holding the baby. You know, that's a problem. Um, It's this very, very strong, you know, low nurturing attitude that it just gets really highly put onto parents. Um, Yeah, babe, don't hold them too much. Make them sleep away from you. Let them cry to sleep and figure out their own way. You know, use lots of, you know, baby swings and baby containers and, you know, other things to, you know, simulate your presence so that they can be on their own. Just so much separation. Um, That would say that's the first part. And then the other parts relate to, you know, a big misunderstanding about what is a nourishing connection with a baby. Um, how to support the stress that babies have, which is really, you know, a lot. Um, and then, and then the sleep part, right. It's in all the domains of nurture. There's, there are low nurturing messages that essentially say, act, treat your baby, act out of the relationship and, and separate. And the high nurture message is, everything your baby experiences, we want to respond in the relationship um, and in a really, really supportive way and connecting way. I love that you talked about the things the way you did and, and it, it puts so much spotlight on low nurture because like you said, it's just, it's almost cultural now um, and it gives the illusion of independence, but what really can be a result of low nurture uh, later on in life? Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's such a good question. It and it, and it's important to know that it's affecting babies and it's affecting parents, right? Our the, our parents, moms and dads, we're not doing very well with our mental health either under this low nurture kind of paradigm, right? And so, um, starting with the parents, you know, our brains, like I said, they're dramatically changed to be very attuned to a baby and more empathetic. And actually our fear center gets activated when we become parents and the presence of a baby calms that fear center. And so when we're creating all this separation, parents, um, you know, in a general sense, on average, are going to be more fearful, more worried, that can lead to anxiety, depression, other health issues, right? And then when we look at babies, um, if they're experiencing low nurture, which is lots of separation, lots of crying on their own, not not a lot of support for their emotions and acceptance, um, their brains are also being shaped to be more stressed out, more anxious, more depressed, um, and more susceptible to, you know, all the mental health challenges that we see in our society and a lot of the physical health issues that we see too. Wow. The importance of this is like so high because we've just been conditioned to believe that, you know, the baby's born and they're supposed to be, you know, fully functioning up and running um, independent person outside of their parents. And I think because we've been doing that for so long, 
it's just something that now we just think is a staple of, of how things are supposed to happen. And I saw one of your posts and it was so good. I wanted to ask you to run for president almost when I saw it because it was so good. Um, and you talked about this, the phrase, well, we turned out fine because people often use this uh, phrase in response to change that's happening in, in the family um, or things that have always been done. And I wanted to ask you, how do you feel about that phrase, we've always turned out or we turned out fine when nurture practices are brought to the family for the first time? Yes, yes. So I think it is a very common defense to some a cycle breaker in a family who's decided I'm going to be high nurturing. Um, often other family members or friends can see that as um, a criticism and a you know a threat to what they had done, and they'll say, "Well, the way I did it." was was you don't have to do anything more than what I did. You turned out fine. Everyone turned out fine. Why all the fuss? Um, why do this? And, you know, I think I always think about that phrase, you turned out fine, as, you know, to me, it means you lived. <laughs> uh, you survived, right? Um and I think that's actually a more important way to say it is that you survive because that goes back to what you said earlier about um, how we might be giving up a lot of ourselves for this attachment um, for survival. Right. Mm -hmm. And so we shape and change and adapt ourselves so that we can attach to our loved, our caregivers and loved ones. Um, and so that's being called fine, but actually it, it could be a source of a lot of struggle, you know, a lot of mental struggle, a lot of pain, emotional pain. And, um, and so, so the definition of fine to me is you survived, you probably, you know, have a lot of issues that you're dealing with. And, you know, our babies don't need to turn out fine. This generation of babies can thrive. Mm -hmm. You know, um, of course, they're going to have, you know, effects, positive and negative from, you know, growing up even with high nurture, but so, you know, so much less um, struggle than the babies that turned out fine. I love that you put so much emphasis on the definition of fine because... We're not okay for the most part. Um, I know I wasn't and I'm still not, but I'm, I'm working on it. So yeah. I think there may be a lot of almost, <laughs> you could even almost call it jealousy. Like I didn't get it. So you shouldn't get it. And because, mm -hmm. you know, if, if, instead of saying you guys turned out fine, if, if imagine hearing someone say you're alive, because that's almost the extent of it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Why not? Why not have the ability to thrive? Why can't you thrive? And why can't those that came before us say, you know what? I want to see you thrive, and I hope that you thrive. Mm -hmm. Instead of, well, you know, just do what we did. It's almost as like yes. you know, misery loves company. Uh a hundred percent, a hundred percent. And I think that's also driving that behavior that we see family members do, where they won't let it go. Like they just won't let it go, right? They will, like I said, they'll be calling out of nowhere some of these families that I'm working with saying, wait a minute, are you still responding to your baby at night? Are you still holding the baby all the time? You have to stop. You have to do it the way I did. Um, And I think like what you're alluding to, I think that because they see that and they see how it was for them. That is probably a source of pain of, you know, that maybe that was painful for me to be, you know, separating my baby when that didn't feel good inside for me. But, you know, it's, it's somehow driving that they don't want anyone else to, to have that experience. I think that yeah. also there may be a lack of, um, emotional maturity there because instead of saying you know well, it's it's difficult to see that because it hurts me because i didn't get it 
They just want it to continue. You know? Yes. Um, what are some tools that you can give or resources for someone who may be wanting to implement high nurture with their, with their infants and they're getting some pushback from their family? Yeah, it's a great question. I help parents with this all the time. I think really having compassion is the place to start. Um, you know, and really saying like, I, you know, I understand you're telling me this because you love me and my baby and you really want the best for us. And I want you to know that I have, you know, thought about this very, very deeply. And I, I, I know my whole body knows that this nurturing approach is the right approach for us. And I would just love it if I could have your support. Um, in this path that I've chosen. Really simple. It, it sounds simple, maybe hard to do um, in the moment, but I think just using what you said as a way to start, even if you can't get the whole thing out or even if it takes two or three conversations, but I think mm-hmm. if, if you've made the choice that you want to break the cycle of low nurture, you have to start standing up for yourself and you have to set boundaries of what a person is allowed to say, how much input they have, and where you're going to say, okay, this is where I draw the line because this is how I'm doing it, regardless of how you feel about it. I'm the only one mm-hmm. in a certain way about it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, yeah, it can be hard depending on the family. Um, but I do think overall, if it comes from that place of love and it comes from that place of like not criticizing what that parent might have done, just saying like, you know, I know, mom, you did, you did such a good job raising us. I love you for that. You know, we just know so many new things about babies now. So things are a bit different. And, and I think this asking for the support piece is so important, even if it takes a 100 asks. Um, But to just have that communication open with your family member to just say, your support means so much to me, I need your support so so much right um because we do we really really do we need all of our loved ones rallied around us and i think for the most part when that input is being pushed it may just be them still wanting to be a caregiver or wanting to be a part of what's happening so Mm -hmm. to to, you know give it back to them and say listen I, i want you to be a part of this but did you know, like, you, there's new information on this? Let me show this to you. This could help our baby's yep. brain develop, and you can be a part of that. And if they yes. feel like they're included in it, then that could be some a, a good way to get them involved. Completely. There's so many incredible stories I hear from families of, you know, having gone through this. And then, like, grandparents are loving holding that baby for naps, right? That's mm-hmm. something so wonderful and enriching and it helps them too it's so good for their nervous system as well and and they can really they can really get into it right they can really get into all of the nurturing practices if you know we can invite them in in a loving way wow i mean just imagine you grow up and you have a picture of your grandparents holding you skin to skin and then your parents holding you skin that's generational yes yes it's wonderful Mm. All right. So your book, The Nurture Revolution, Grow Your Baby's Brain and Transform Their Mental Health Through the Art of Nurtured Parenting. Can you talk a little bit about the book and what it means to you? Yeah, absolutely. It is um, completely my life's work. It's it's my experiences from the probably from when I was in my mom's womb all the way up to, you know, a couple of years ago when I finished writing it. it really takes in all my experiences as a person, as a baby, as a mother, uh, all my experiences as a neuroscientist and as a doula working with lots of families. And it's written, you know, to really be a place where parents can find and, and professionals can find a lot of confidence in their nurturing instincts and their nurturing intuition. And so the first part of the book is a lot of the science of, you know, why are babies' brains so, you know, flexible in those early years? And why does that experience matter so much? I really want parents to be empowered by how much their nurture impacts the baby. 
um, as well as their own brain. So there's a chapter there on how does the parent's brain change and what are your new superpowers when you become a parent or a grandparent or anyone who spends time with a baby has massive brain changes. And then, and then the, the, the rest of the book, um, a good part, more, I'd say more than half, um, is dedicated to nurturing practices to just sort of help parents understand, you know, how they can show up for their baby in a nurturing way in every state that a baby's in. So I would always remember, go back to myself with my son. He's five now. Uh, when he was a baby and some, you know, it got tough, right? He's had big emotions or something happened. And I would always say, you know, let's return to nurture. I know what to do right now. You know, in the moment you can feel, I don't know what to do right now. This is too much. I'm overwhelmed. But if you have practices to return to yourself, return to nurture, you, you know, can feel really confident that you're doing an amazing job in in any situation your baby can kind of throw at you. So there's lots of chapters on how to nurture babies. And then there's a whole chapter also on how to nurture yourself as a parent. I find that as we become parents, often it's, you know, a time where we're looking at our own stuff for the first time, looking at our own nervous systems for the first time, because you know, those distracting coping mechanisms that we, you know, often we develop, they they can't work when we have a baby because, you know, we can't probably just like go shopping or go scrolling on our phone or go tune out watching TV, right? We have to show up a lot more in life when we have a baby. So I provide a lot of um, reflection and a lot of tools for parents to take care of their own nervous systems as well as they're developing. How long was the book in the, in the making? Well, I started writing it seven, seven years ago. Um, I, I left uh, my last research position and started writing it. And, um, and then I kind of put it aside for a while while I worked as a doula for many years and also became a mom and then I returned to it. So the the book in this form was a, you know, a year and a half or so, a year and a half to two years of work. Yeah. Now, because you took a break and came back, was there anything that you learned, um, through studies or experience that helped you kind of maybe plug in gaps or, or fill in areas where you may not have been a hundred percent sure, or you maybe have writer's block? Yeah, I think the biggest change was I needed to find the balance of how much, how deep to under, how to explain the science, right? Because I really didn't want parents to start reading it and say like, nah, I don't, this is, it's too overwhelming, right? I wanted to meet parents and and professionals where they could really take in the information in, you know, a really kind of digestible way. And so the first versions of the book were much more filled with, you know, little details of, you know, all the neurobiology, which is lovely, and I love it. But I think over the years, I worked with parents and got lots of practice explaining the concepts and hearing back from them what parts were the most helpful. And and that really helped in shaping the final version. That's great. Glad you did it, even though you know it may have taken a little bit longer than you wanted to. I'm sure it's really so good and beneficial for everybody because from your perspective, I mean, even if it took 20 years, everything that you know and everything that you've learned, we're, a lot of us are just seeing this for the first time and we're putting these concepts together and trying to understand these things. So I think the book is a gift and I'm glad that you did it and I'm grateful for everybody that will have an opportunity to see it, benefit from it, and, you know, introduce this new style of parenting in their families. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It's You're it's welcome. such a pleasure to share it. And um, especially with someone like you, who's really thought so deeply about, about it and all the implications. So it's, it's such a joy to, to explore it with you. I appreciate that. All right. So last question, if you could use your platform to encourage any mothers 
parents or anyone who maybe didn't receive the love and nurturing that was their birthright um, and who might be struggling or on the fence about talking to someone, what would you say? Yeah, I think to just sort of give people that message of hope that, you know, even if we didn't have these experiences as in our infancy and our childhood, so much healing and so much neuroplasticity is available to us um, as adults and even as we become parents. And, you know, there's so many incredible therapeutic modalities available. I think that's another really exciting time we're in right now. Um, We talked about one modality that you and I both really enjoy uh, (laughs) ourselves. as just as an example. Um, and, you know, just to know that we can, we can nurture ourselves. We can find so much healing if, if we're dedicated to it and engaged in it. And um, yeah, these, these wounds are deep. Um, absolutely. But, but there is, there is so much that we can do to, to rewire and, and heal. Love that. I think just for me, just knowing that skin to skin contact with the baby or not letting the baby cry themselves to sleep um, or just remembering that the child is doing its best to develop its um, emotional language and their nervous system and their brain is developing. Thinking about all those things and just when the baby may be crying or you don't understand what's going on, just being able to return and nurture. Let me hold you. Let me connect with you. That can have mm-hmm. such a huge impact on the the baby's life, you know, as an adult and even the, the parents as well. Just that little nugget for me, like, it's a game changer. Yeah, completely. There's so much healing in that relationship. Yeah, even without any other input, um, just within that relationship with the parent and the baby, tremendous healing happens. Exactly. Yeah. All right, Dr. Kirschenbaum, thank you so, so much for this. Thank you for putting in the work and being dedicated to provide support for families and mothers and babies. Um, I just want to say thank you for your time and for doing this with me. Thank you so much. I really, really appreciate your time too. If someone wanted to find you online or on social media, where can they find you? Sure. Um, I'm on uh, Instagram mainly as Nurture Neuroscience Parenting. And there I'll have links to my website and all my offerings. Okay. And then your book can be found. And my book can be found um, everywhere that books are sold. Love the local bookstore um, or bookshop.org. Um, but everywhere you buy books, you can find it. Yeah. And it's called The Nurture Revolution. Alrighty. Well, Dr. Kirchenbaum, again, I want to say thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you for who you are, for what you do, and for how you do it. Thank you. Thank you, too.